Welcome to Simply Explained English. I am Lisa. And I am Eric. If you improve your English easily, this podcast is perfect for you. So let's get started and make English learning easy. What are the words today, Eric? The first word today is respectively. Then we will continue with to grasp and put off something. Then come or get to the point. And the final one is look on the bright side. Okay, let's start with the first word. The first word is respectively. 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 That sounds a bit formal. What does respectively mean, Eric? You're right. Respectively is an adverb we use to match items in one list to items in another in the same order. Okay, I think an example will help our listeners understand better. Eric, would you like to go first? Sure. Here's an example. Alice and Bob are 10 and 12 years old, respectively. So, in this example, we understand that Alice is 10 years old and Bob is 12 years old, in that order. Exactly. It shows a direct connection between each of the names and their ages. Okay, I think I'm getting it. Here's another example. Mary and John won the gold and silver medals, respectively. Good one. This tells us that Mary won the gold medal and John won the silver in that order. Yes, exactly. Respectively helps to avoid repeating information. Instead of saying Mary won the gold medal and John won the silver medal, we can use respectively to make the sentence shorter and clearer. It's right, Lisa. Remember, respectively usually comes at the end of the sentence. Good point. Now, how about a sample dialogue? Sounds good. Class, I have your test results. You scored 85, 92, and 78, Jane, Tom, and Sarah, respectively. Oh, that means I got 85, right? That's correct, Jane. And Tom and Sarah got 92 and 78, respectively. I'm happy with my 92. And I guess I got 78. I'll try to do better next time. That was a great dialogue. The teacher used our words respectively to help us match each person to their score without repeating names. That's right, Eric. The word respectively helps make the order clear so that we know which score belongs to which subject. Otherwise, it might be confusing to understand who got which score. Exactly, Lisa. Respectively is useful when you have two or more items that need to be matched in a specific order. Do you think respectively is a difficult word to use, Lisa? It might be a little tricky at first. Because it's not a word we use every day, we can use it in emails or reports. But once you understand how it works, it's very helpful. I think so too. It's a good word to have in your vocabulary, even if you don't use it every day. I hope our followers have understood respectively. I hope so, Lisa. All right, let's move on to the next word. The next word is to grasp. To grasp? To grasp. Okay, let's explain what to grasp means. To grasp has two main meanings. First, it means to take and hold something firmly with your hand. Second, it means to understand something, especially something that is difficult or complicated. Now, let me give an example sentence. The baby tried to grasp the toy with her small hands. It means that the baby tried to hold the toy firmly with her hands. Exactly. Now, Lisa, can you give us another example? Sure, here's my example. It took me a while to grasp the concept of algebra. Great one. It means that it took you some time to understand the idea of algebra, which can be difficult for many people. It is very true. It is hard for many people. Yes, Lisa. And when we use it to mean understand, we often use it with concept, idea, or meaning. 
Good point, Eric. Now let's listen to a short dialogue using our word to grasp. Teacher, I'm having trouble with this math problem. What part don't you understand? I can't grasp how to solve for x in this equation. Okay, let's break it down step by step. First, we need to grasp the basic concept of algebra. After you grasp the concept, we will get into the details of some problems. That was a helpful dialogue. The student and teacher used our word to grasp to talk about understanding a difficult math concept. Yes, they did. Eric, do you ever have trouble grasping something? Yes. Last year, I had trouble grasping how to use my new smartphone. It took me a while to learn how to use it effectively. How about you, Lisa? I sometimes find it hard to grasp new grammar rules in English. I think it's very normal. Everyone learns at their own pace. It's okay if we don't grasp everything right away. To practice a lot and asking questions is really important to grasp something. I agree. Do you think to grasp is a useful word to know, Eric? Yes, I think it's very useful. We can use it for both physical actions and understanding. It's a versatile word that we can use in many situations. Do you prefer using to grasp or other words like understand or hold? I like using to grasp because it sounds more specific. I agree. I think to grasp can make our English sound more varied. That's true. Well, that's all we have time for with our word, to grasp. Let's move on to our next word. The next word is put off. Put off. Put off. It's a phrasal verb. Put off means to delay doing something or to decide to do something later. For example, I always put off doing my homework until the last minute. It means that the person delays doing their homework and waits until just before it's due. Now, Lisa, can you give us another example? Sure. Here's my example. We had to put off the picnic because of the rain. Great one. This means that they decided to go for a picnic later because of the bad weather. Now, let's talk about how to use this phrase. Put off is a separable phrasal verb, so we can say put off something or put something off. That's right, and we often use it with gerunds, ing forms, like put off doing something. Good point, Eric. Now let's listen to a short dialogue using our phrase put something off. Hey, have you started studying for the big test next week? No, not yet. I keep putting it off. You shouldn't put off studying. It's important to start early. I know you're right. I always put things off and then feel stressed later. Why don't we study together? That way we won't put it off anymore. That was a great dialogue. The friends used our phrase, put something off, to talk about delaying their studying. Yes, they did. Eric, do you ever put things off? Oh, absolutely. I often put off cleaning my room until it's a total disaster. What about you, Lisa? I sometimes put off making important phone calls. I know sometimes it's bad to put things off. It is definitely a problem, especially when it comes to important tasks. I totally agree. Putting things off can make us feel stressed later. How do you stop putting things off, Eric? I try to make a schedule and stick to it. What about you, Lisa? I like to break big tasks into smaller parts. It helps me not put them off. By the way, what would you say put off fun things too? Not really. I'm all about enjoying the fun stuff right away. But when it comes to work or chores, that's another story. Same here. I never put off things I enjoy doing. I think many people are the same. I totally agree, Lisa. Okay. Well, that's all we have time for with our phrase, put something off. Let's move on to our next word. Our next word is get or come to the point. Get to the point. Come to the point. 
come to the point is an idiom and very useful in English. It means to talk about the main idea directly without giving unnecessary details. Yes, exactly. We should mention that come to the point is often used when someone is talking for too long and you want them to focus on the important information. Right, Lisa. And when we use get or come to the point, not get the point or get at the point. Okay, let's look at our first example sentence, Eric. Sure. The first example sentence is, John, please get to the point. We don't have much time. It means that John is talking, but the speaker wants him to quickly talk about the main idea because they don't have much time. Yes. Now, let's hear the second example. Here's the second sentence. The teacher asked the student to come to the point and stop telling unrelated stories. This means the teacher wants the student to stop talking about things that are not important and to focus on the main subject. Perfect. Now, let's move on to a short dialogue that uses get to the point. Mike. We only have 10 minutes before the meeting. Could you come to the point about the project? Sure, Sarah. Sorry. The main problem is that we need more time to finish the report. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you got to the point quickly. Did you notice how Sarah asked Mike to get to the point? She wanted him to talk about the most important part of the project because they didn't have much time. Mike understood the need for more time to complete the report. This shows how to get to the point helps us communicate clearly and effectively. Absolutely. So, Lisa, do you ever tell people to get to the point in real life? Sometimes, yes. Especially when I'm in a hurry or if someone is giving too many details that aren't necessary. What about you, Eric? I do too. Sometimes, in meetings, people start talking about things that aren't important and it helps to remind them to focus on what really matters. Exactly. And using come to the point isn't rude, if you say it politely. Being polite is really important. That's true. And remember, it's always good to use this phrase when you want to keep conversations clear and focused. Great advice, Eric. Okay, that's all we have for the phrase come to the point. We hope this helps our listeners use it more confidently. Yes, and now we'll move on to our last word. What is the last word, Eric? The last word is look on the bright side. Look on the bright side. Look on the bright side. That sounds positive. What does it mean, Eric? Look on the bright side means to focus on the good things in a situation even when things are difficult. So, it's about being optimistic and thinking about the positive part of things? Exactly. We use it to encourage people to be hopeful and not give up. Okay, let's give our listeners some examples. Eric, would you like to go first? Sure. Here's an example. I know you're upset about missing the concert, but look on the bright side. We can go to the cinema instead. So, in this example, someone is disappointed about missing a concert, but the speaker is trying to cheer them up by suggesting a different activity. Exactly. They are focusing on the positive alternative. Okay, I have another example. Okay, so you didn't get the job, but look on the bright side. You gained valuable interview experience. Good one. In this case, the speaker is telling someone that even though they didn't achieve their main goal, there were still some positive things from the experience. Right. Now, how about a sample dialogue? Sounds good. This weather is terrible. I was really hoping to go for a walk today. I know, it's a shame. But look on the bright side. We can finally stay inside and watch that movie we've been wanting to see. That's true. And we can make popcorn and hot chocolate. Exactly. Look on the bright side. We might even enjoy this rainy day more than our walk. See? Even a rainy day can have its advantages. Exactly, Lisa. Ben definitely helped Emily to look on the bright side. 
He did. So, Eric, do you think you're good at looking on the bright side? I think I'm generally a positive person. I try to focus on the good things in life. What about you, Lisa? Me too. I think it's important to have a positive outlook, even when things are tough. I agree. It makes life much more enjoyable. Definitely. All right. I think we have reached the end of today's episode. Thank you for listening to Simply Explained English. We hope you learned something new today. See you next time. Bye-bye.